The advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Piche and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grand Piche is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Piche. Dr. Grand Piche. Dr. Doreen Grand Piche. Dr. Doreen Grand Piche is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod and I'm joined here by the fabulous spectacular Dr. Doreen Grand Piche. Good morning. Good morning. Shannon. How Good are morning, you? Good morning, everyone. Are you impressed I let you say something before we get <laughs> seven minutes into the show? It's so nice. Uh, so thrilled to be here with you guys. We're live right now and we're welcoming a, a new member to our staff. We're saying congratulations to Chris Desmond, who's calling the show today for the first time. We're so happy to have him here as our creative content uh, person and our, our creative content director. So Everybody welcome Chris. We are live right now uh, in as many places as you can think of and thrilled to be here. We're going to be live for the next hour talking with Dr. Doreen Grampiche and having her answer your questions. If you don't know her, welcome and be excited to get to know her because she's a true expert in the field of autism. I, you know, I, I've said this many times of late, there is no one that I have met on my journey that cares more that knows you, more, Jim. that fights more for individuals on the spectrum and for the families that love them. Thank so, you, thank you. Are you kidding me? Thank you. No, I mean, it's, it's you, how can you not care when you're in this field or in this world, right? It's such a wonderful place to be. Well, I'm thrilled that I get to know you and I get thank to sit you. here and share things thank and have you. people around the world ask questions. So you guys can be asking questions right now. You can write in on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, all the places that we're live, you can write in on those platforms and ask questions. Some of you have written in qu questions in advance. We've been off for a couple of weeks, um, but we're thrilled to be back. And I can see uh, Bunmies has already written in a question. Wonderful. We do have some questions to start. I also want to give you a couple of different disclaimers here that um, we will start with our starting topic, which is dealing with change, because uh, this is a time of year there's a lot of change. Many of you have written in about things that you're going through, and change can be a little bit unsettling. Mm -hmm. I was saying, you know, change can be hard, and I thought, question that. <laughs> Does it have to be hard? It can be unsettling. Maybe that isn't necessarily hard. So we're going to talk about some of the questions that you guys have written in, but we are already opening up the topic that you can write in on anything, any question having to do with autism, and ask Dr. Doreen. We do give the disclaimer that there is no expert in any field who can give individually specific advice in this platform. That's just a reality mm -hmm. um, because it's a disservice to the person to imagine that someone can sit here not having met them and know exactly what's going on. Exactly. But here's the beauty of what we're doing. You have eyes on the situation. You can write in as much information as you have. I always like it when you include the closest major city to you so we know where in the world you are because the resources are different in different places. So you ask the question, be as specific as possible, hang out, because sometimes Dr. Grampiche has more questions for you to get more specific. Right. But she will give you the, the wealth of her knowledge and maybe give you questions to go back and ask the expert of record. And that's kind of how this works. And uh, we've been able to be here for, we're in our 13th year of amazing, production. Amazing, amazing. Um, and, and so all of those videos, you should know, you can watch what we're doing here live, and that's wonderful. But if you want to watch some of the things in the, in the library in the past history, you can go to our YouTube channel. But there's two YouTube channels now. Mm. So there's YouTube that's Autism Live, but you can also find Ask Dr. Doreen on YouTube as well. And it's the same thing for the podcast. There is the Autism Live podcast now and the Ask Dr. Doreen podcast now. So we've been saying to people, if you already had subscribed to Autism Live and you've been getting the Ask Dr. Doreen feed, we were doing that for a while. I think in the next two weeks, we're going to cut that off. So you need to go over and subscribe to the Ask Dr. Doreen feed, and then you'll get both things and you'll be happy. All of that is free to you. We do, obviously, because as a podcast, we, in order to keep the lights on, we have tons of sponsors. And when you listen to the podcast, you'll hear the sponsors. Some of you have written in and said, hey, I would like a version that is, does, is without the ads. 
So there is now a version that you can get if you go to glow.fm slash autism live. It's $5 a month or you can, it's even cheaper if you subscribe for the year and then you will get the, every time we upload a podcast, you will get it sans the, the advertisements. Mm -hmm. So if you want that, we encourage you glow.fm slash autism live. I think I've covered almost all of that. So shall we jump into questions? Let's do it. Or do you want to talk briefly about the performance that we saw on Saturday from oh, somebody that was we so love? Spectacular, my goodness. Yeah, we really should talk about that a little bit. Okay. So we were very lucky. We went to a an amazing, amazing show at the um, which was in honor of the Erasner Family Center and it was just spectacular. It uh, you know the, the star, I guess, who came out at the very end was Ringo Starr, yeah. and, which was unbelievable yeah. to just be able to, uh, in such a kind of a small venue, to be able to see Ringo perform, which was just spectacular. But there were a lot of really, really good performances, and um, a, a few bands before uh, Ringo was Toto, and of course, um, we were just, I think the highlight of the whole show was that Logan Shepard, um, our dear, dear friend and one of my prior kids, uh, played the drums with Toto and it was a spectacular performance. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my family of course knows Logan for a long time, but they were just blown away. Yeah. Like blown away. My to husband, see him as an adult. Yeah. For, I, for, Two days after that, my husband kept just talking about Logan, not even Ringo, you know. He was yeah. like, Logan was the best part of that show, yeah. It I mean, amazing. I think a, a lot of people felt that way. You, you guys have heard us talk about Logan before on the show. You've seen videos of Logan. If any of you have a skills account, you've seen videos of, of Logan when he was in little, session, yeah, yeah. in session, getting help. Um, and if you, any of you have heard me do my crystal ball of autism talk, where I talk about how the universe sent me to a house to, mm -hmm. to design a closet when I needed to know what to do with my son with autism. It was Logan Shepard's house. Yeah. They're the yeah. people who told me about you. Yeah. I would not be here yeah. had it not been for Logan. Logan yeah. was the inspiration because I saw how well he was doing and went, whatever you people are doing, I want to do that. Right. And that, and they were, they were with you. Yeah. And, yeah. um, so in the card of old, which we'll talk about that in a second, but, you know, so he has been the, I, I'm going to get real emotional. He's been the snowshoes, the, yeah. his footprints, his yeah. parents' footprints that I followed all along. And we've, it, yeah. we've reveled in all of his successes. He was a drummer early on. And when I remember when he was 14 and we went to see him play at the local pizza parlor. And yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, this yeah. kid is amazing. And then I remember seeing him at 17 when he was playing um, at the Universal City Walk right. with, the, with the, the band players from KISS and, and the audience went crazy. But then to see him at 22, when he's been touring the world, yeah. to see him at 22 sit in for Toto and rip the roof off of the Orpheum Theater. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and for those of you who have any interest at all, like I wanted to show my family after the show some other stuff that Logan's done. And if you go online, go to YouTube, and you just put in Logan Shepard, a bunch of stuff pops up. In oh, particular, yeah. um, I think he was 15 when he did this, which was you know the you know the movie Whiplash, which right. has that whole segment uh, that that uh, musical piece mm -hmm. called Caravan. And he does that, and it's mind blowing. You just go, he's oh so my talented. gosh! Yeah. yeah, and he's a nice young man, and he's sweet. He's a lovely person, and you know, it was just lovely to see him before the concert and, yeah. and meet his girlfriend. And you know, he has a, a rich, rich life, and 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 he's doing really well. Yeah, it was crazy good. It was so I good. especially there's so that good. thing that he does when he's playing and he flips the drumsticks. Oh, it's so funny. And I lose my mind. So I was talking to his dad afterwards, uh -huh. and he said, Peter said, I was so worried when he did that. I, I was know. like, he's gonna lose the, the drum. I was like, he's so good. But I mean, that's the thing about Logan. Like, right? He started. He used to have this kind of self-stimulatory behavior, and and I think it was Sabrina's brilliant idea, and and we just gave him a pair of drumsticks and yeah. he just uh, became incredible. Yeah. I want you to know if you're like, I want to see this performance, there is a video of it on Autism Live right now. If you just like scroll down past this video, 
you'll be able to see that somebody posted a video. It's from the audience, right? And you can't, like, you can hear people screaming in the audience as he's playing and, and when it's over, but it's not the same as being there. But let me tell you, it was, I, I it think was it amazing. was the biggest applause of the night. Yeah. I also want to give a shout out that um, a wonderful comedian, Chris Tenney, opened the show, and he's somebody that's featured on our Stories from the Spectrum. And I was really proud of him, too. I said, oh, yeah. I'm a former stand-up comedian. If they had offered me this gig, I would have said thank you, but I'd rather be dragged behind the Budweiser Clydesdale. Yeah, he opened. It was amazing. Oh, amazing. that's the worst job in the world, to be a stand-up comedian and open for a rock concert with nobody warming up the audience for you. Yeah. He, and he killed. I was so proud of him. Okay, so we've talked about that. And, and also, I want to say that we were one of the official sponsors. The Autism yes, Network, yes, yes. Ask Dr. That's Doreen, right. Autism that's Live. Right. Um, we were one of the official sponsors because uh, because you believed so much in the event. So thank oh yeah, you for that. and I'm and and I love their center and I think they do really good work and I wanted to make sure they get support. Amen, amen. Okay, so we're opening for questions now. Some of you have already written in saying hi to Bun Mies and saying hi to Urban Frugal Chick. I want to be an Urban Frugal <laughs> Chick. That's what I want to be when I grow up. Okay, I want to start with a question about change that our good friend Parker wrote in last week. And Parker, I'm sorry that I had to wait till this week to get to it. Um, but he says, he says, I threw a semi tantrum due to the staff at my psych doctor asking me if I tested positive for COVID or went out of country. I think the COVID rules are coming back and I'm not happy. I am afraid that masks will return and social distancing will return. The last time I was asked to social dis distance, I blew up at the gym staff and my friend had to calm me down. I said, I am vaccinated. I don't need to social distance anymore. And the masks of all the types are sensory nightmares for me. I know of those flower lanyards, but really I don't want one unless I have to, uh, due to fakers, getting one to get around the mask rules when they were enforced mm -hmm. at the time. I know that other self-advocates and parents will have this problem come up in the future. So let's ask now how, uh, so we can have a video on it when it comes. Uh, and Parker, I, you know, there's a lot of people who've been expressing to me this last week that they're having some anxiety about will yeah. we have to go back into things of past. Right. It changed. We ch first we went in, then we went out, yeah. then we've been in and out and whatever. So what do you want to say to our yeah. love? We love Parker. Of course. And Parker, I understand what you're going through. It's tough. And, and as Shannon said, there's a lot of anxiety about this issue. So let's separate the two things. One is um, the anxiety and how to deal with it, right? And the other is COVID and whether or not it's going to happen again. So the whole concept of just, you know, you're so aware. This is what I love about Parker. When you write in, there's mm -hmm. so many sides to it when you, you write in all the different sides. You know, you, you have a good ability to see different perspectives. And I think you just need to go back and, and start asking yourself and maybe write down what are the things that cause me anxiety about this. And hey, maybe you already identified that the main thing is just the, the sensory aspect of it. And if that's the case, why don't you start working on that? Start preparing practice, maybe um, that find something that is less sensory restrictive for you or just, you know, uh, bothers you less. Uh, work on it because sometimes the fear of something is more than the thing itself. So, uh, you know, just work on it and also start telling, like remind yourself that um, all, everything we all went through, which wasn't, nobody, it wasn't a normal way of life. Nobody really loved having to do all that. I mean, I remember the beginning, we didn't even know if we could bring our groceries in, oh you know? Goodness, yeah. Nobody really liked that, but we all had to do it because we remembered the concept of safety and health, right? And just keep reminding yourself of that and keep telling yourself, I'm doing this for the better, for the good of the world, for everybody's, uh, you know, health and just remind yourself of those. That said, it's not easy. So what I wanna tell you is that, you know, any kind of, um, what's happening with COVID right now, and any kind of virus in general that happens, it changes form and it starts to become a whole different thing, but it becomes weaker. It doesn't suddenly become stronger. I'm not saying there's always a possibility that some other weird thing could happen. I mean, COVID itself was very, very unexpected oh, yeah. and strange. But 
uh, this particular virus, the, the Corona-19 virus, is getting weaker. So, and yes, it's changing form. In fact, I think yesterday or the day before they came out with a completely new vaccine. Oh, really? Yeah, because the vaccines were not catching this particular strain. That's what happens with vaccines, with viruses, they mutate. And so, and as they mutate, they change symptoms and all kinds of stuff. But overall, they mutate weaker, not stronger. So that's something good to be aware of. And, you know, and that's it. It's, it's reality. It's part of the, the things that we have yeah. to deal with. I got I to gotta say for me, Parker, because, you know, I've shared before that I have a fair amount of anxiety and that I've done cognitive behavioral therapy, is that I have to talk to myself. Yeah. But that's one of the things I learned in cognitive behavioral therapy and, and that when I start to freak out about something, I, I ask myself questions like, is it happening right now? Yes. It's not. Oh, okay, so I don't need to worry about it right now. Is it possible that it will happen in the future? Well, it happened in the past, so of course it's possible. And so then I say to myself, oh, okay, it's not crazy to be concerned about that. It, but did I yeah. survive it the last time? Did most of us survive it yeah. last time? Yeah. Did I find a way to make it work so that I wasn't constantly anxious? Did I find a way to wear a mask? Am I finding a way and, to wear, not wear a mask And what now? can I do now to prepare myself exactly. if it should happen? I think preparation helps us calm down a yes. little bit. That we get, like what would I need to have to yeah. be ready for it if it were to yeah. happen? And, and that in that way, I remind myself, the funny thing is, is that when there's a real emergency, often we don't have time to panic and worry because you, you, you skip into motion. Yep. And so when I remind myself, is anything happening right now? Uh, if I have the time to ask that question, almost always the answer is no. no Nothing right, is happening right, right now because I have the time to talk to myself. Right. When something's really going on, you don't have the time, you react. So that helps me to go, nothing is happening right now. That's true, absolutely. And then I go, oh, I'm safe right now. Yeah. That's a really helpful thought for me. So anyway, I, I hope that that helps, Parker. Uh, we had somebody else who wrote in and said, we're having a tough time with the transition back to school. Different teacher, different rules. It is second oh, yeah. grade. Any ideas? Change. That's the whole concept of change. Yes. So again, it has to do with preparation. And this is really, really important because if you spend about the first couple of weeks really meeting with the teacher, talking to the teacher, setting expectations, understanding what the teacher's expectations are, learning about her process, her or his process, um, becoming, you know, uh, um, a team right now, then the rest of the year will be easier. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, and if you keep waiting to see, then things might not work out. So I really, really recommend you set up a meeting with the teacher. Start by telling the teacher that you ha you're worried and that, you know, your child has a hard time with transitions and give the teacher a list of things that might make it easier for your child. Yeah. Like, you know, can he, um, uh, can we know ahead of time what the day's schedule is going to be, what the agenda is, or... Can he sit next to these children because he knows them? That kind of, anything that's going to make it easier for the child, for your child, just share those with your teacher and stay in contact and maybe give the teacher, a, a, did they say what grade? Second grade. Second grade. So a lot of teachers, when the kids are that young, they will actually have a notebook that goes back and forth where they're writing notes, you're writing notes. I found that to be so valuable. When we were working with kids, it was always like something you could look at and figure out what's going on in the classroom. Yeah. So yeah, just lots of communication right now, I think, will help. And um, the good thing with, you know, we start school here in the States, we start school around September, and it's so close to the holidays, it's yeah. almost like the kids have a short period of adjusting and then they have some fun stuff. Yeah. So, you know, uh, hopefully your child, child has some good stuff to look forward to. Also, um, it helps a lot with anxiety and your child's transition if they are familiar with the other kids. Mm -hmm. So if you can set up either play dates or maybe have a welcome back to school party, something that like helps the other kids and your child get to know each other, lots of games they can do to get to know each other, that really, really helps yeah. if you have friendly peers. Now, obviously, it helps a lot if your child is prepared. So you want to make sure that you know the different things that are required and your child is capable of doing them. 
whether it's just classroom stuff or academic stuff. Yeah. We did a, a, a parent to parent like about two weeks ago about things you can do to help make the fall a success. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even though we're already started, some of them are still, like we talked about, anything that you can do to make it more fun for them. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's that you put something extra special in totally. their lunchbox or that you make a plan for after you go to school today, we're going to go to the arcade. Yep. Whatever, well, like whatever the reward, you know, you did so good at school today or, you know, now you're in second grade, so now you get to do this thing that you couldn't do when you were in yep. first grade. You know, whatever works with your kiddo, even, you know, I, I made a big push and everybody didn't love it, but I said, if you can afford it, I think it's really important that they get fun clothes that they picked out to wear to school. Yeah. Because that makes it more exciting. When you're putting on the new shoes that you picked out, For sure. you're more wa wanting to go, like, wear those someplace and play on the playground. So whatever it takes to make this, I, I know sometimes our kids are just like Debbie Downer. I don't want to go. I don't yeah. like her. There's yeah. no rules. I don't whatever. But I'm sure you guys are creative. You can find a way yeah. to be like, okay, how can we make this more fun? You know, it's funny you say that, Shine, because there's a lot of studies that like very long time ago, I remember when I was like reading about things that increase social behavior for, for our kids. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of studies that show that if the child has an object that others are interested in and they can take that to school, they're allowed to take it to school mm -hmm. and, and share and talk about it with their kid, with their friends, it's a, a very significant social draw of the other kids. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a new kind of pencil, or it's a, a very cool backpack, or it's just something that is, you know, obviously you have to stay within the rules of what is allowed to take to school. But as Shannon said, you know, like if new shoes, maybe it's the straps, maybe it's whatever it is. Yeah. But if they have something cool that they can share with other kids, that's always going to be motivating and again this is the you have to pay attention to the fact that the more the child knows about what's going to happen during the day the less anxious they're going to yeah. be about it right so uh, just getting becoming familiar knowing the routine knowing the classrooms knowing yeah. if they're going to be walking around or that kind of stuff all very very important things is it crazy that I remember my first day of second grade? Do you really? I wow. really do. I remember, and it was, you know, we're talking in the 60s, and the, the teacher, I don't remember her name, but she had, like, one of those bouffant things that it was like a cake, that it had, yep. like, three things. And, and what I remember was that I came home and said, I don't want to go to this. It was a new school, yeah. new teacher, and I said to my mother, I don't want to go there anymore. And, and, I, and my sister, I talked to her, and she said, why don't you like it? I said, because I didn't understand what they were talking about. Yeah. She said, what do you mean? Because in the school that I had been in, it was whenever we subtracted, it was always minus. Okay. So it was three minus one equals two. Yeah. Yeah. And when we went, I went into this class, and she used the word subtract, and I'd never heard that word before. Oh. And so I didn't know what they were talking about, and that made me never want to go again. Yeah. And when I told my sister, she said, oh, that's the same thing as minus. minus yeah. I was like, well, why didn't somebody tell, tell me? Yeah. Second grade. First day of second grade. So, but I'm sure that's why I remember it because I left and I was like, I'm a dummy. I'm an idiot. I don't, yeah. I have no idea. What does that word even mean? Well, Shannon, I went from Iran oh. to a boarding school in England, boarding school, oh. and I didn't speak a word of English. Oh, I just want to go <laughs> so, back and hug that little girl and go, it's going to be okay. I mean, you're gonna, you're even, a genius. Like, and you know. There was so much stuff that I didn't understand. You oh, know? I... So you know. It just teaches you to pay better attention to things around you. I would have crawled up in a ball and cried. Um, but, you know, there we are. Okay, I want to get to that uh, Bunmies has written in and wants to know about methyl B12 shots. They say, after uh, how long of giving a six-year-old the, well, they <laughs> just said B12. I want to make sure that you're talking about methyl B12 because that's a different thing. Um, how long after giving a six-year-old the B12 shot should we expect to see re results? And they said... Uh, do we have to give the B12 shot to a child under the butt skin or just directly straight shot? So I think you should be seeing a result within the first month, honestly. And if you're not, you should probably go back and talk to the physician and uh, figure out if you need to continue doing this. I mean, with the methyl B12 shots, they are, should have done some blood tests initially to be able to tell you whether or not your child actually 
should be doing this because this is not necessarily a fun thing. Although the needles are tiny. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think in term, I don't, I think it's a, uh, uh, it's not a subcutaneous. I think it's an intramuscular. You have to do it, it, it. She's right that it's under the butt skin. You yeah. have to go from the yeah. side, not. Not in. Okay, so then it is subcutaneous. So that means you're going under the skin, not yeah. into the muscle. I think the reason they tell you the butt skin, a lot of parents I know used to do it when their kids were asleep even, right? Because it's hard to get your child to come and do this a couple times a week. So yeah. they would, essentially the child was asleep and they would very quietly go and do this and the child wouldn't even respond uh, or react or wake up. But yeah, I mean, I, again, I know it's a very difficult and kind of an invasive procedure. So you should really see an effect if you're not seeing an effect Within the first month, go talk to the physician again. And I just want to add that I want to make sure, like I said before, that it is a methyl B12 because you can get B12 yeah. just from your pediatrician. Which is intramuscular. And that's right. going to be a different situation. Completely different. And the B12 would then wake your child up and make them pretty active. There we go. What, what you really <clears throat> want, I would assume, with autism, the thing that we're normally talking about seeing a result from is a methyl B12 shot. Yeah. You have to get that from a compounding ph uh, pharmacy. You have to have a doctor prescribe it. And often there's a mix mm -hmm. that they, it will be methyl B12 and something else that your child needs. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd have to see a physician for that. And let and me tell you that you'll be able to tell from the size of the needle. Oh, there you Methyl go. Methyl B12 needle is tiny, tiny, yeah. and a regular B12 shot, the needle is relatively big. And I don't know about regular B12, but we gave my son Methyl B12, and it was bright red. Like, it's yeah. very, it's like, Cyanophone. it's bright red. Yep. And, and I learned at a Taka conference, they had a station where they had, they actually had, I think they were like, you know how they, like uh, mammography places, they have fake breasts where you can sort of yes, poke them to yeah. feel. Um, and they had those <coughs> like cutlets and they had us practicing doing the shots into yeah. those so that we could see because you want to go yeah. just under the skin and make a bubble. I do want to say too that we were told to do it in his sleep and I could not do that to him. Yeah. We talked it through with him. We said, this is a shot. Yeah. This is what it's for. And, you know, and he was fine. Um, so that's my two cents on that. Yeah. Um, so, and and she... it was worthwhile, man. I, it's the one thing I kicked myself that we didn't do it sooner. Yeah. Lisa Ackerman tried to talk me into it. Everybody tried to talk it me into it. It made a big it. difference for him. And, oh, and within about a week and a half, yeah. um, that yeah. his language, it wasn't what I expected, but you know, his language and being able to contextualize things for us. Mm -hmm. Just blossom. Like he would say to me, sometimes he'd be talking about his Legos and he'd say, red under gripper, yeah. red under gripper. And I wouldn't know what that meant or what he needed it for or whatever. And the morning that, like about a week and a half after we started Methyl B12, he came in and woke me up and he said, Mom, do you remember when we went to Disneyland and they had the Blue Sky Place and they had the whole setup where they showed how cars, how they built the whole Cars wow. Land, like the movie? I think they should do that with the movie that they have that's about World War II with the pigeons. Yeah. And they should recreate London. <laughs> and I went, Whoa. what just happened? Because before he would have just come in and said, Blue Sky, and pigeons. Yeah. And I yeah. would have had to figure out what the heck he was yeah. talking about. Yeah. But he could say, he could contextualize the, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Woo. And he used to say, because we gave him his shot every third day, it was really hard to remember. And he would say to me at that point, he would say, Mom, I'm due for a shot and I can tell because I'm having trouble getting my words out. Wow. Wow. So, that's yeah. amazing. And How I wish that. So at that point, he was seven. Seven. And they and everybody had tried to talk me into starting wow. when he was six or five, and I was like, no, amazing. we've got other things amazing. going on. So yeah, uh, yes, I have to do it when he's asleep and going straight is what I do, but I'm worried that I, I'm not doing it well. Yes, it's from a compounding pharmacy. So if you're doing straight, that could be part of what's going on. You got to go it just from takes the side longer because when you go under the skin and put the liquid there, it takes longer to absorb. Yeah. You're going into the muscle, it's a different thing. So you just lift up, like pinch up and go in, and then you're doing it under the skin. And we did it from the side, so that yeah. I, I didn't, I wasn't, I, that's how, you know. Yeah. But yes, you wanna do it that way. Okay, I, uh, I got two questions I gotta get to, or Marina will, you know what, she'll <laughs> yell at me. Uh, somebody wrote in last week and said, good afternoon, I have a child with autism that is nonverbal. 
What are the odds of him not improving if he only attends six hours of ABA therapy mm -hmm. and sometimes four, only four, he is an 11 year old. So yeah. an 11 year old, nonverbal, six hours of ABA some sometimes weeks, four, four some uh, other times. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, it's just not enough to show a difference. Like that's, I think, the main thing I wanna tell you. I think every parent should be aware that the early studies on ABA showed that there's a big, big, big difference between doing something like 10 hours a week and doing 40 hours a week. Huge difference. In fact, the kids that did intensive therapy, which was about 40 hours a week, uh, m half of them actually lost all their symptoms and recovered. The kids who were doing 10 hours a week, uh, only one out of 10, so 2% actually um, lost their symptoms. So the likelihood of making enough progress when you're doing four to six hours a week is low. You'll make some progress, but the issue is that time is going by faster than the progress you're making. So let me try to explain that. Um, as we age, so you know, every given year of life, we become one year older, and our mental age, our, the things we learn, also becomes one year older. So any one of us, a typically developing person, would have a mental age and a chronological age that are the same, okay? And that's how, that's how we are, and that's how our IQ becomes 100, because it's one over one times 100. Now, when you look at someone who has any kind of disability, like a learning disability or autism or ADHD or anything like that, it's harder for them to learn things for one reason or another, but they're still aging at the same time. So their chronological age is still moving forward, but their mental age isn't moving forward as fast. Yeah. And so what happens is that they, over time, fall behind their chronological age. And what we try to do with the ABA and with speech and OT and all these other types of interventions is it's, we're trying to catch the individual up with the things that they didn't learn so that their mental age catches up to their chronological age. So what that means is typically with a child who's in therapy, they should be learning faster than peers and they should be learning twice as much because they're trying to catch up. If you're doing four hours or six hours, they're definitely not learning faster than, than aging. So it, it you know, you might be able to accomplish some very kind of smaller skills. Like for instance, the child might learn, instead of hitting, I can point to an icon, for instance. And that in itself is very meaningful yeah. because, you know, you're reducing challenging behavior. But um, you won't, you're not giving your child the opportunity to learn as much as they can. So really, that is why we insist on intensive therapies. It's not because uh, it's a financial thing for the provider. That doesn't matter. There's thousands of kids who are getting therapy. But it's because you lose, as your child gets older and older, I mean, just like us, you lose that brain plasticity, their ability to learn faster. I mean, look at, like, you know, me at my age, I don't even I can't memorize another number, like forget it. There is just my, I tell my kids, I'm like my hard drive is full, like yeah. do not give me new information. But you know, when you're a child, and especially before the age of seven, you learn a lot, right? Yeah. You just learn, you're exposed to a new language, you learn, you're exposed to three new languages, you learn. So um, the younger you are, the more plasticity your brain has and the easier it is to learn. That's why, like your child's 11 right now, nonverbal, I would really be doing, I mean, and then that's the other issue. The older the child gets, the more, I guess, responsibilities come into their life. So yeah, for instance, competing school. Yeah. yeah, so now you are obligated to also take your child to school. And so that reduces the number of hours of available, availability to do ABA. 
So really, um, it just you know, do as much as you possibly can because the more you do, the more your child is going to learn, and that's the truth. Yeah, and here's my thing. You know, I get so upset because I see the industry of ABA backing off on intensity, and it makes me crazy um, because it's just not yeah. com it's not what the science says, and it's not common yeah. sense. If you were going to go and learn a new language, and you and it was life and death to learn it. You know, you could go and take a college class that's two hours every week, and then at the end of the semester, how much of that language would you have? Right. If we dropped you in France, would you be able to communicate? You would know a couple of words, and that's what you would know. You would have a beginning understanding, but there's no way that you would be fluent right. after one semester. Right. Right. But if we took you and said, we're going to put you through a Rosetta Stone, and then we're going to drop you in France, and we're going to intensively make you speak French, yeah. within that same time period, you could become fluent enough to communicate all your basic needs it's true. in that time period. It's true. And you're asking your child to learn a new language. Yep. And it, so the question becomes, how intense can you allow it to be the amount of time that he's immersed in that language learning? Correct. And, you will, and it will match, you know, what you put in is what you're going to get out. So if he does four to six hours a week, you're going to get that that sort of Absolutely. fluency, right. but if you do more, you will get more. That, definitely. So that's my feeling on that, but ask me how I really feel. <laughs> um, okay, I want to get to, first of all, um, Bun Me says, last question, can we demonstrate how to give the shot? I've got one better for you. I would encourage you to go to tacanow.org, TACA, their website, and I'm sure that they have a video. If you, if you go to resources and put uh, methyl B12, I guarantee you, and if they don't, I want you to email me afterwards and I'll make you a video, no. right? Because I'm sure that they do. That's how positive I am. So it's TACANow.org. It stands for the Autism Community in Action Now. Um, dot org. Go there, put in methyl B12, and you will probably find everything that you need to know about all, all of those things. Um, so all to the good. Um, I want to get to Urban fr uh, Frugal uh, Chick, <coughs> who I want to be when I grow up, um, that her question, which I love, what changes does Dr. Doreen want to make with Card 2.0? So happy she is back. I'm happy she's oh back, Oh, my too. gosh. Well, thank you for asking that, and um, I'm making a lot of changes. <laughs> happy, to, happy to summarize some of them, but um, it's a process, and it's difficult. It's... I, I think I was actually telling my husband the other day that I, I don't I don't think I've ever worked as hard as I am right now. I don't not even when I first opened card. Like I always used to say when I first opened card because it was only me, yeah. I would go to work at like six a.m. and I would come home at nine p.m. and it's probably about the same hours right now, but it's a lot more intensive. And maybe that's because I'm older, but also it's because. There's a lot that's been done that I have to figure out how to undo. And that's a process. So I can't, it's not like I can build it up like from scratch, right? It's right. just because everything I undo will affect people's lives. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a matter of figuring out how to do that. My goal is a lot of, like I'll, I'll just summarize it. First of all, my goal is to make the company break even because the company is not doing very well. It's not a healthy company. Obviously, a lot of people know it just went through a bankruptcy. So I have to make sure that we cut expenses to the point where we are able to break even, right? That's super important because, like, how long can I support this company? Well, and it was about to go away. We need it was to, about under, to we under, dissolve under, understand yeah. the consequences of when it's yeah. not solvent. It was about to completely go away, and you prevented that from happening. Yep. I mean, and, and and so in order to keep it going, to have Card be there forever, there has to be responsible leadership looking at this so that yeah. it can exist. Yep, exactly, yeah. exactly right. So that's number one, which has to do with, you know, and I'm trying not to cut things that are important to the organization. So it's going to be a process. It's probably going to take about a year before the company can break even because I can't cut things drastically now. I don't want to, so I'm going to, I'm increasing training. I'm changing training a little bit. I'm increasing it. I'm really, really heavily invested in trying to change the training that we provide to the operations managers. There's a lot of good, 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 high quality training 
for the clinicians, mm -hmm. which I love, I oh, and I'm going to keep that, but um, there wasn't really good training for the operations managers. I'm going to try to change that, just teach them a little bit more to be compassionate leaders. So that's one thing. Um, I'm going to give the operations managers a little bit more resources. I'm trying to figure out if that we have a second, uh, we have a half of a person who's administrative in every office. They're called the administrative coordinator, but they're only really helping the OM about half of the time, and I'm going to probably make them full administrative because I think the, our operations managers need more help. Yeah. Um, most importantly, I'm, we're doing a very, very heavy recruiting of behavior technicians. So if there are any parents, I'm going to be putting a lot of stuff out there for parents to help us actually bring in we want to double our behavior technician staff, literally double. And I, it's not a matter of recruiting. It's a matter of us internally taking care of these folks well enough that they get through the first three months. Yeah. It's a hard job. And when a lot of, you know, the, a lot of folks come in and they are not, they're not sure what this job is and um, <clears throat> they experience obstacles, you know, like if a child is sick and they cancel, then the therapist doesn't have three hours of work that day, that kind of stuff. And these things add up. So trying to figure out ways to increase our behavior technicians, train them well, get them on the field, because a lot of our kids are not receiving the hours they should. And that's just a shame. Like, I couldn't believe that I saw a list today that had easily 100 families on there with zero hours. And I was like asking, what is this? How is that even possible? And, but it exists. And so it's, it's really clear that we need to double the behavior technicians. I think that's going to be my primary goal. Um, and I mean, if we do that, I think everything else kind of falls into place. So with that, we need to figure, I, I have to bring back some things. Like we used to have a, a lot of fun things for behavior technicians that we don't have anymore. I want to bring back bonuses for the behavior technicians. There was a point system. Every hour they worked, they got a point, um, and they could trade those points in for fun things and for vacation and all that sort of stuff and bringing that back. Um, there were levels of expertise for the behavior technicians that I'm going to bring back. There's a lot of stuff that just focuses on the BTs, the behavior yeah. technicians at CARD. So really, I'm just focused on the current sites. It's an or half the size of the organization that I used to have before. It's yeah. much smaller. Um, so we're just trying to make it as good as possible. We're not planning on any expansion right now. We're just planning on making the company more healthy right now. There you go. And I know and, that, I know that, go ahead. And, um, of course, I've asked my dear, dear friend Shannon to come back and start talking with parents and talking with staff. And, you know, it's so important for the employees to really, for them to understand what they do in the world and for parents to understand how critical it is. Like the message that you and I give on our show mm -hmm. for the past 13 years, it's just super important for people to realize that <clears throat> you have to commit a few years of your time and dedicate your time and availability and learn and do this right. Yeah. And I just want to say, because I know for you, it's like it's the guiding principle for everything. So you don't say it as much, but that all the things you just said, I know that your guiding principle is so that we better serve the families. Absolutely. That because, that's the whole reason I mean, for it, everything. Absolutely. The number, like the things that I see that make no sense to me are like, for instance, I mean, I, I'm not going to start talking about the stuff they did before, but a lot of families were let go because they weren't opening their availability enough. A lot of families were not taken in because their child was over the age of five. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like I am definitely opening up to over the age of five. In fact, hopefully, God willing, as soon as we break even, we're going to reopen our adult sites. Like, I do not want to they shut down the adult sites. I want to bring those back. There's a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, but I, I just have to say, because I watch you working so hard, and I, wa I, I have said for, for more than 15 years that I've, I've ha had the great fortune to be in the room and watch you make decisions when people are coming in and saying things, well, it, you know, it's a money decision about this, and I have watched you time and time and time 
say we are going to do what's right. Yeah. Because we are <clears throat> here to serve the families. That is, that is what we 100%. do and that, that is always, always your guiding principle. So, and I, and I always say that I, I'm always disappointed in people and I'm always looking for the real deal. And, and that is what I find Thank in you, you over Sean. and over and over again. And you always, always make choices based on, on those individuals and that you take care of your employees too. I mean, that's like the, the key to it. I always say the, the, in making the company um, successful again is three things, right? It's take care of the employees because they're the ones that take care of the patients yes. and then take care of the company. Yeah. Like everybody forgets that it's an, it's an entity that has to be watched over. Absolutely. And thank God that you do that. So they said, thank you for answering you. their question. Um, so I want to take just, cause we have a couple of minutes left. There are, you guys can write in questions, but I want to take just a minute and talk about the changes and I mean like even us we've yeah. been going through changes lately and sometimes change can be a hard thing I've been talking to parents lately and one of the things that I see is that we you know our kids sometimes have a hard time transitioning yeah and then we take that on and sometimes say well we can't change something because the kid is going to have a hard time but the reality is yeah. that sometimes it's we the parents are having a hard time transitioning. And that can be, I, I mean, I had a, a talk with a parent the other day who is very entrenched in the fact that her four-year-old needs to be a preschool. Mm -hmm. But every indication the school is saying to her and, and her provider is saying to her, it would be better suited in this year if he were having more intensive therapy. Oh, wow. But she is afraid of that change. Yeah. And I heard it and was talking with her and I thought, oh, I, I remember. And I'm, you know, I'm still a little bit. Uh, every now and then you'll say to me, you know, is this happening? And is that because you're afraid of it, mom? Yeah. And, and I have to own it. Yeah. Like it's hard for us when our kids are doing things and, and the change is hard for us. So I wanted you to talk just a little bit about that, about how do we instill in our parents the ability to be brave in the face of change. Yeah. Because even taking your child to therapy, we all want our, ch our children to do better, right? And to learn more and have more skills. But just the act of taking them to a center, that is change for us. Oh, it's so hard. It's so difficult. And that <clears throat> hits exactly on what I was talking about with our operations managers, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, as a parent, it's, the, it's, probably harder even than just taking your child to school because mm. we, we, for some reason, we trust the school system, right? And we think, well, everyone puts their child in school, so my child's going to be safe here. And then when you go to a center and you have to kind of, and your child has a disability that prevents them from communicating well, then you're just really, really worried about, like, what am I going to, who, who are these people that I'm entrusting my child with? And is this center safe? Are the people safe? Are they doing something useful? What am I, what am I doing, right? Yeah. And the anxiety just increases. And there, I think when I have anxiety over something, there's a few different things that help me. Obviously, the first thing is just, you know, I, I learn as much as I can about it, like, like a crazy amount. Like, mm -hmm. I'll look it up and I'll research it, I'll talk to other parents, I'll go to the place and see it, I'll do all kinds of stuff to feel like, okay, I know enough. Like whatever research there was to be done, I have done, you know? So I know enough. So this is now just really about me. It's not like, you know, taking my child there is, there's some extrinsic factor that makes me worry. It's just about me and the unknown. And of course that's very normal, right? All of us have a fear of the unknown. All of us have anxiety when it comes to change because change is unknown. We don't know what else is coming. But what I do in those two scenarios is I remind myself that generally speaking, we are where we are supposed to be. Like there's a safety factor. It's very hard for me to explain this because I have such a um, strong belief that you go down a path that you are intended to go down no matter what and that all you are like you know and i believe like that's that's 
I guess the universe, the world, just takes you through certain experiences and your purpose is to just learn. So fear or apprehension of something that hasn't happened holds you back from that, that experience, holds you back from the opportunity to learn. And so I kind of look at scary scenarios or situations that are going to cause anxiety as opportunities to learn mm. and opportunities to become stronger. And then it becomes a positive thing for me because then I'm like, okay, you know, I've done all my uh, preparation, which for me is just learning and, you know, just research and checking everything and blah, blah, blah. But then the opportunity, so I'm ready, right? And the universe has given me this opportunity and I need to go in and learn. And oftentimes, you guys, things just happen without you even like really making an effort. You go into situations and they come upon you and they might be anxiety provoking. And before you know it, it's the anxiety part is behind you. Yeah. So a lot of it is just kind of moving forward. I will say with the experience of autism, and you should speak to this more because you've lived through it, I will say one of the things that I find with parents really helps them with the anxieties of every new step with their child is the community of other parents, um, which a lot of the you know early years, parents didn't have that. That didn't exist because first of all, the prevalence was lower, much, much, much lower. I mean, when, it, when you have something that's one in 10,000 kids or one in 15,000 kids, you don't know a lot of other people who understand what you're going through. You don't have other people who've paved a path for you. you just, they don't exist. You don't even have people that you can really sit and share with, you know? So now that exists. So in that sense, it's an amazing time. And um, the very first thing I would do is just build that bit village around me because those other families who also have experienced all the things that you're going through are an incredible uh, force of, of safety and security. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I, <clears throat> I love your view of the world and that everything, it's that Byron Katie loving what is yeah. kind, of, uh, yeah. kind of thing of figuring out, you know, how do, I, what how, is. how do I accept what's happening? I don't right. have to be content with it, but how do I accept it and then allow myself to learn from it? I love that. I, I do want to say that, you know, this, this last couple of weeks talking to so many parents, I've been so grateful and just so moved by, because yes, I, I think that people who have kids on the spectrum, see, I'm going to get all emotional. I just think that they're some of the bravest people on the on, planet. And on I never, the planet. I fully agree with you. I never meet a parent that I don't find like to be a really compelling soul, that yeah. I'm grateful that I got a chance to meet them. Yep. And I long to be able to meet everybody's kids because I find that they're also awesome people. Absolutely. You know, so I always think back to what Peter Shepard, Logan's dad, said to me the first day I met him. He said, well, welcome to the club of people, the club that you never thought you wanted to belong to, but once you get here, you're gonna see that it's filled with really amazing people. So true. And I've just been so struck this last week by how fortunate I am in all areas that, you know, I'm fortunate that I met you, I for I'm fortunate that my child got access to things and that people said to me, you have to do intense and, and that I listened. I'm grateful that I listened. Yeah. I'm yeah. grateful that we went through it. It was hard. And I can look back at parts of it and go, I don't know how we did that. Yeah. But I also am on the other side now. And I love being able to give back and say, here's hope for your backpack is a very wonderful thing. And, and in particular this week, we started a thing during the summer where we, were, we did an intensive parent to parent about talking about getting AIDS in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And we put it out there and said, here's sort of what the argument that you make. And one by one, we're hearing from these moms saying, I can't believe it. They just gave me the aid. That's amazing. And, and so I got another one of those first thing this morning when I opened my email. And I know that there's a mom probably watching that's still in the fight phase. But I want you to know more and more people are saying that it worked. So that just, because I yes. remember how hard yes. we fought for everything and, and the fact that now, like, we can say, here's the path, and, and it's working for other people. Just, I go, oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited that, because I said early on, you know, let's do everything that we can, and then let's help whoever we can. 
Let's not have this not count for something. Yeah. Let's leave yeah. a mark that helps people. And that's what my family tries to do. Right. Uh, and that and is so very important. enriching. I mean, it's so important, Shannon. You just, you know, you made me realize that there's a thousand, more than a thousand little steps or decisions that a parent has oh. to make. Yeah. Right? Like, how much of this will I do? Does my child need that? Should I do this? Is it safe? Should I do that? Uh. And it's so many different things, and it's so hard to know. As I always say with autism, it's the weirdest thing, because what other um, disorder or illness or difference is there in the world where you have to d research all of it yourself, yeah. right? No you got to find gonna, the path. I mean, it's insane. Like, yeah. no, uh, after all these years, there's so many disputes, I guess, about what's the right direction. And that's, yeah. that is mainly because children with autism are so different from each other. Yes. And there's confusion about what should be done. But when you find the path, it is after, you know, hundreds of angels guiding you because <laughs> there are just so many people who will say, do this, do that. And you, you, you know, you eventually make a decision and you try the different things and you see a result for your child. And it's an incredible, incredible journey. I mean, it's, uh, you, you know, we were talking to Laura a, a, a couple of months ago and, yeah. and like, I just sit there and I watch this brilliant young man oh. who, uh, and, and I just think to myself, my God, what a, what a journey to go through and to come just like your son, you know, and to come out the other end and say like, wow, thank God that we are where we are. Yeah. We must have done a, a lot of the steps right. Yeah, you know, it's just shocking. I mean, there are moments in the day where even even though that my life and my work yes. is in this field now, there are moments in the day when my world is not about autism. Absolutely. In any way, shape or form. And I always like to tell the story that when um, we we I picked out my son's high school that I wanted him to go to when he was in second grade because I, st I woke up one night and I was like, where's he going to go to high school? Yeah. Like, it's not going to work to go to regular high school. He's got to have a high school that's different yeah. and, and f you know, feeds to his strengths. So I, I found a place when he was in second grade and stalked them. And then he had to get in by a lottery system. It was a night. And I went and sat there and they drew his number in the lottery. And I'm telling oh you, it was, it was like winning the lottery. And, um, and he got his acceptance letter to get into high school and we went out to pick up sticks, which is, you know, which is like a regular little yeah. restaurant. And we were sitting in the back and we were reading his letter and saying, you know, welcome to the class of, of 2022, I guess, 2021. And we were just reading the letter and going, look at your life and you're going to this college prep high school and just all these good things are coming. We were being so loud in the corner of this yeah. little restaurant. And there was a man who was sitting there with his headphones in just two tables away. And a couple of times we were singing and being stupid and just being ridiculous, right? My husband and my son and I. And, um, and I, at one point I was like, oh, we're probably disturbing that gentleman. And then we saw he had earbuds in and we just decided not to care as much. Yeah. And then when we were packing up our stuff to leave, he took his earbuds out and he stopped me and he said, I just want to tell you, it was so lovely to hear your family Aww. like talking about how excited. He said, you're at a very exciting time in your life. And it was just, he was an older man and he said, it was just lovely to hear and sit in. And, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry, did we disturb you? He said, no, 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 no. It was really just lovely to hear nice. this family nice. be so excited. And I walked away and then I stopped and I realized, he doesn't know. No, no. He has right. no, no idea, idea that there was a day when somebody said to me, he can never, <sighs> he'll never speak. Yeah. He'll never, yeah. you know, be without diapers. Like he doesn't know. Oh, that's know. so crazy. Yeah. He just enjoyed like just our any day. Other person. Yeah. Like any other person and was like, oh, what a lovely family you have. And he has no idea what, you've what been we through. went through when we, you know, when our landlord yeah. died yeah. and we were, we had no air conditioning for an entire summer and our our behavior technicians were coming to the house and we Amazing. were hanging laundry in the house to keep the house clean cool so oh that they could gosh. do therapy like he has no idea yeah the insanity that we have gone through <laughs> to get to here <laughs> and i thought wow yeah. we're here yeah thank i'm god. all weepy thank today god. thank god we're out of time 
But I do want to say um, that uh, Bonnie said, uh, everybody said, herbal frugal cheek, chick, excuse me, said <laughs> thank you for answering my question. Bonnie said thank you so much for that sure, explanation, for answering all of our questions. God bless both of you. Thank you, and, and back to you as well. I do want to say we're on the light schedule this week. So this is the only live show that we're doing this week. Um, but don't panic because we've got more shows coming in the ho hopper. Uh, we have Dr. Grampiche next week. We're going to bring Autism Live back next week, and some of our extraneous shows. We're also going to we're going to be making some changes. Yeah. Right. Um, because there's a lot of stuff going on, but I I think you guys are going to be so excited. We've got a plan for some new content that we're going to be putting out. That's awesome. Um, that will be outside of the podcast. I think you guys are going to be super happy and, and love that. Also, don't forget that we have our Halloween oh, event shoot, coming up I on the forget. 28th of October. And hopefully, yeah. I think we've sent out invites. We have sent out um, some We'll put some information some on, on the website. And there's too. stuff on the website, on ACT Today's website. It's called All Ghouls Gala. If you go to act-today.org, there's a, a tab that says events. Uh, if you are going to be in the Los Angeles area, you really should buy a ticket. It's a great ticket because it's low priced, especially for what you get. Um, so low priced. And we will be there. You will get to hang with us and Dr. Temple Grandin and Joe Montaigne and Ariva Martin and a bunch more people. We've got more and more celebrities saying that they're coming. I can't give them away, their names away yet, but those three people are being honored. So Dr. Temple Grandin will be there at a Halloween party in Los Angeles it's with amazing. us. It's, it's crazy. Amazing. You should come, and it all benefits Autism Care Today, which is the charity that you founded that gives grants to families for the things that which they Which is need. really focused on copay grants right now, which is awesome. It is awesome because that makes a huge difference. So uh, do check that out. Uh, tickets are flying, so you should get tickets soon if you're going to come to L.A. to do that. Uh, you can still donate if you want to donate. You can buy a ticket for an autism parent here. We've made that possible. That yep. If you can't come but you would like to send another autism parent to the event, we will gladly scholarship somebody else. Definitely. Um, so, Or if you have a business and you want to donate something for the silent auction, oh, yes, please, please contact me. Um, because I'm looking we're forward to all that. We're starting that now, yes. yes. Oh, yeah, we're well into that. So all of that, so do do check that out. We're going to be doing more about that as the, the days move on. So uh, we're out of time, but I so appreciate you guys being here. I appreciate you Thank more you than so you much, could Anna. possibly Always know. lovely. And we, there will be some programming maybe later on this week, but nothing new. We'll do some reruns, and then we will be back next week. So until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.